So today we have Pastor Manuel Redamosa. He grew up in Northern California, received his BA from Seattle Pacific University in 1994, taught preschool school for Head Start in San Joaquin Valley for three years, and graduated from Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota in the spring of 2004. On graduation, he moved his family to San Diego and served as the associate pastor at St. Andrew's Lutheran Church until he was called to be the senior pastor in 2017. He currently serves as the vice president and treasurer of the American Indi Indian Alaskan Native Association of the ELCA. You got it. <laughs> Woohoo! Pastor Manuel is here to share his story with us this morning. Thank you, Pastor Manuel. All right. Well, thank you all uh, for being here. I just want to open up and say, like, this is my experience um, that I'm going to be sharing with you and my experiences. Um, and uh, it also kind of puts me in a very vulnerable position. And I hope you all recognize that uh, for a person of color and for all of us um, people of colors. And we often find ourselves in these positions, um, sharing our experience this way with our church. Um, others in our synods, um, in our own Pacific Asset have their own experiences that they can share as well. And, um, you know, I don't have any like conclusions or like real answers for stuff, but just some places of uh, potential and places of, I think, hope um, that I want to share with you um, and some much needed change um, in our church. And in particular, I think through this, I hope we can find some hope for the future of the ministry in our world and openness uh, to leading of the Holy Spirit uh, through this time together. So um, I am first generation Mexican American. My dad was born in a little adobe uh, brick house that my great grandfather built in Tijuana, which that house sat about a mile from the San Ysidro border entry there for until about 10 years ago when it burned down. Um, and so that was the house he was born in. So he's a naturalized citizen. Citizen, So I'm first generation on my dad's side. My mom was born in a little house in Holbert, Oklahoma, um, about 20 miles from the Cherokee tribal headquarters. And they met in Stockton, California. And that's where I taught Head Start. And that's where most of my family is there in Stockton. Um, I am a, um, also a tribal member with the Cherokee. So I'm a voting member of the Cherokee tribe in Oklahoma um, through my mother's uh, work with that. Um, growing up in the East Bay um, in San Ramon, um, so the suburbs, very white suburbs. I was often the only child of color in the classroom, but it's what my parents wanted for us, my, my sister and I, um, to grow up there in the suburbs. Um, in those schools and those new schools at the time and the track housing there in the East Bay. Um, but we spent much of our, we spent our weekends and most of our vacations in Stockton where all the family was on both sides of the family. Um, the first time that I really came to kind of a sense of uh, that I was a person of color was when I went to Seattle Pacific University, which is a, a Methodist school, a fairly conservative Methodist school and um, discovered that they had put us, there are like three or four dorms on campus and they're, they're on the north side of Queen Anne Hill and the highest dorm that had the be most beautiful views, um, none of my group of friends ever got on that, in that dorm. We were all put on the lowest floor at the bottom level of the dorms that were like really literally on campus. So all of my friends were all the students of color and international students as well. And we all lived on the same floor there at SPU. And I figured out like, okay, they didn't know what to do with us. So they put us all on one floor and it was great for us, but it was a mistake on their part because we became a lot of trouble for them. We even put our own publication together, um, a little black kind of black market newspaper highlighting the racism that was going on on campus and other issues as well. Um, 
so that was my first kind of sense that, like, yeah, I'm a person of color. And then went back to went back to Stockton and hot head hot head start. And they put they um they ended up as a teacher. They were putting me in the worst neighborhoods in Stockton. Now you know Stockton, if you haven't read, is probably one of the worst cities we have um, as far as crime and poverty. Um, and so they would put me in the worst neighborhoods, which was great because I often had family there, so I could had go on my lunch break to my cousin's homes and have lunch or visit them for dinner. Um, and then um, towards the, my second year, I started looking for seminaries, ended up at Luther Seminary as an American Baptist. Um, the first year at Luther, um, you know, there's a, there's, it's a lot, of, a lot of work being in seminary, um, but also being in St. Paul, Minnesota at Luther Seminary, um, I really understood what it was to be um, a minority um, in the classroom. I learned really within weeks of starting that I was just going to sit in the back and keep my head down and work hard to get through seminary, but not speak up a whole lot um, because it was, it was often shut down most often by the student body. Um, and uh, although very most often supported by the faculty, I was supported by them. Um, and so, I mean, even something as simple as, you know, I would be sharing something about liberation theology in my coursework and they would, in the student body, the students would shut me down like, well, that's a lesser theology and it doesn't have any, doesn't have any impact on what the work we're doing or the call that we're gonna be in. So I learned to just get in there be there for the lecture, go to the library, get the books I needed and get off campus. Cause I did not ever feel welcome by the student body at Luther Seminary. Um, and I sat towards the end of my, my spring, my first year, I went to the Dean's office and was sharing with her my struggles of trying to find my place at, on that campus and in that student body. And, um, and I was in tears crying to her, like, I just can't, do this. It is such a struggle to be here. All these students have gone to camp together. They've probably have also gone to Lutheran schools, undergraduate schools together. I have no, I have no place of any place that I can attach to them or have any kind of, and they have no sympathy for me. So, um, but I stayed through it. Um, and uh, my third year, I took the year off because I decided I wanted, I decided that God was calling me to be a Lutheran instead of American Baptist. And I attended um, Central Lutheran Church in Minneapolis um, for that year um, and worked three jobs, work in construction, driving a school bus and working at Home Depot and starting a shelter program for, um, an after school program for kids in shelter in downtown Minneapolis there at Central. Um, and so during that time, being at Central was really, it was a great time for me to be there, supported through that shelter program, um, getting to be with the people, what they would say, the people of the city there at Central, they had a lot of, um, not only people in shelter, but those who also lived on the street. Um, and so I really enjoyed that time. And then that became my internship site as well, as I was going through the nation process. So I was on pastoral staff during that time. Um, which became a huge learning for me because during my internship, the, one of the reasons I decided Central might be the right congregation for me is it is a large like flagship church. And they were the first church of, of that size to call a person of color to a senior pastor. And that pastor was Craig Lewis. Now the rest of the pastoral staff was all white. Um, and I could see the tension already happening when I started, when, before I was even on pastoral staff. The tension between the pastoral staff, Craig Lewis, Craig Lewis and also the council. Um, and towards the end of that time there, in my internship, Craig Lewis ended up resigning his position as senior pastor because of that struggle. Much of that struggle was due to racism was due to their lack of understanding of who they had called and what that call meant for them and what the direction that church 
was going to be going if they if they were going to lean into what his what Craig Lewis's uh, leadership was going to be. Um, I finished my internship and uh, spent two years uh, part time at Luther Seminary um, and began looking for a call. Um, for 10 years, I had my hair about as long as it is right now. Um, so it was about halfway down my back. But I knew that if I was going to get a call to any congregation in the ELCA, I would have to cut my hair because no congregation, very few congregations would call me back in 2004 if I had long hair because I would be seen as a troublemaker. Um, and it's, you know, it's, I'm, I'd be too liberal for most of our congregations. And so I cut my hair and went back to kind of almost like a flat top um, so I could conform as much as I could to what the unsaid requirements are to be a pastor in the ELCA. Um, I had a, and so I got a call to St. Andrews, which um, St. Andrews is a, you know, and was a very white congregation, typical Lutheran congregation in middle-class suburbs. And um, they called me as the as a youth associate pastor of youth ministry here. Um, and I, you know, it was fine. It's very much kind of like the suburbs I grew up with in East Bay. So I, I knew how to relate to, to people here because of my experience growing up in the East Bay of San Francisco. Um, as a youth pastor, I, you know, would do their do our youth trips, but also just youth outings. One of the first times I figured out like, this is not, I'm not comfortable with a lot of this stuff was when we went, we took the youth group down to 32nd Street uh, Naval Base to go bowling. And the adult who was driving that I was, I was riding with, we had kids with us, got off about two exits too soon. And we got off in the, off at National um, Avenue here in, San Diego. And as soon as we got off and we were driving to the airbus, he realized he had gotten off too soon. He turned to us and said, okay, you guys, you need to lock your doors because we're in the hood. Well, this hood that we were in is where my family is <laughs> here in San Diego. My family owns property right there and homes and businesses right on National Avenue. Um, but obviously that didn't, you know, didn't come to mind or he didn't know when he said that, said those words. Um, so it was the first time I kind of sensed that sort of racism almost, I mean, it, those little microaggressions in some ways. Um, and there were so many of them um, for me um, coming here. And um, I mean, even when I, when I would talk about something as simple like my family would often probably every other week go down to Tijuana to have dinner or go have to have lunch and we just at that time we could go down there and come back within an hour and be home and so I would tell you know part of my sermon on Sunday morning was I went to dinner last night in Tijuana and visited my family came across the border and there was always just questions about well why, why would you do that why would you risk going down there I'm like, well, this is where my family is. This is why I've been going down, crossing this border since before I can remember back in the 70s. Um, and so in that part of that, so the piece about the neighborhood on National Avenue and the piece about Tijuana is all about fear. People in San Diego fear anything south of the eight, Interstate 8, and especially anything south of the border because they haven't experienced it. They haven't been down there. All they get is the news reports, you know? Um, and I would say from my family in Tijuana, they fear neighborhoods here in San Diego because not only we have a large homeless population that's all over the sidewalk, which they tell me, my family tells me about, but also they hear about the shootings here in their news. So there's that, you know, it goes both ways, but most people don't realize that here in San Diego. Um, and as a native person, I think one of the things that I've, I've noticed here too, is that, um, one of the piece of fact about San Diego County 
we have 18 Indian reservations in San Diego County, which is the most Indian reservations of any county in the US. And so my question for us as a synod or as people of the church, do we have any ministries in native communities? Do we have any kind of um, relationship with any of our native communities here when we have 18 reservations, have we ever had any kind of relationship with the native communities here? Other than going to casinos and enjoying the buffet. I mean, is there anything else that we do as a church? Um, how much, I mean, and another highlight I would say too is for us as the LCA, you know, the, the furthest Southern church that we have is St. Mark's and Chula Vista. There are many miles between St. Mark's Chula Vista and the border and the coast where we have no ministries. So, you know, that, and that's been that way for, I think, decades. It has not changed. And so I'm wondering, you know, like work, those are places of ministry that are hopeful places where I think we, those are two places where I think we could, we could be part of the Holy Spirit's calling us in those places if our eyes are open to, seeing that. Um, unfortunately, um, and I'll use a term that may offend you, our churches, because most of our churches were established post-World War II, they were established in what I would call white ghettos. And that doesn't mean they were poor and impoverished. That just means they were poor in other ways. They were poor in experience. They realize, okay, this is our neighborhood and this is where we're gonna stay and we're not going anywhere outside any of these places because that makes me uncomfortable and I'm gonna lock my doors when I have to drive through those neighborhoods. So what can we do to, re to go out and be experience the wealth of diversity in those neighborhoods in our areas, not just here in San Diego, but in Orange County as well. We have no ministries in Imperial County to my knowledge. And why is that? So another, you know, working class area, typically people of color, typically Latino, Mexican um, neighborhoods, areas in the Imperial County that we don't have any ministries, but there's so much potential there. Um, we also have, you know, we could, we could either establish ministries and we do have abandoned ministries in those neighborhoods as well, because those white ghettos changed over the last many decades. And so we abandoned those ministries because according to the numbers, they weren't thriving. And so we abandoned them. You know, what, 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 we, what did we lose there um, for that potential for ministry? Um, one of the things that often comes up when we talk about churches and possessiveness and uh, bringing in other, other people of color into our ministries. When we let them use our kitchen, we let them use our kitchens. Um, I often hear about complaints about, well, the, the kitchen smelled so bad after they used our kitchen, or they didn't put the forks back in the drawer, in the right drawer. Little things like that, instead of just being open to like, this is a wonderful thing that they get to use our space. And we can, you know, we'll, we're going to deal with it, and this is part of the complication of doing ministry in this world. We as Lutherans tend to want things very straight-lined and worked out very well and uncomplicated, which I think doesn't work well when we want to do ministry outside in the world to a very changing, changing world um, that has continued to change, and we've fallen behind. Um, for us as a synod, and the Pacific Senate in particular, we've been behind for many decades. Um, and one thing is we don't have anybody of color in our synod office in those leadership positions. Um, pastorally, we're, we're pretty thin too. Um, congregational leadership, it's just not here yet. Um, and I've been here 16 years in the Synod and not, have not seen much of a change. Praying and hoping for a change. 
for new leadership. The one place I see of hope for us is our youth. Our youth and the synod um, are open to this change, are more than open to this change. Um, and, uh, and they're also, there's diversity within our youth. So that gives me great hope. But those youth need to see um, people that they can identify with in leadership in our synod. And so that is my, my challenge to myself is how I'm gonna bring up leadership and my challenge to all of you as leaders in this church, how are we gonna make that change? You know, and it's complicated and messy, but I know that I, you know, I had to have people of leadership that I, that shared my name, my, you know, Latino name that I could look up to, to say, yes, they, I, if they did it, I can be part of that. I can, you know, we, we all need that. So I think that's as long as I need to go. <laughs> so, and I hope I've, I've done convicted you in some way and not just guilted you um, and made you a little uncomfortable as well. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that conviction. So now we have the opportunity to share our, what's on our hearts in breakout sessions. So um, I invite you, I invite each of us to share openly and honestly the truth of who we are and how we are doing in this moment as individuals and as leaders in the ELCA. We will join, um, I will put you in breakout sessions and you will need to click the join button. I will give you a two minute warning and um, I will pray your time together is spirit led. Awesome. Well, as we're joining back together, um, I would invite any of you to share what you discussed without breaking any confidences, maybe share a theme or what touched your heart in the conversations this morning. I would like to share a question for Pastor Manuel. Um, and it's one we talked a bit about in our group. Um, when we talk about diversity and introducing diversity, uh, the experience, I, I'm a member of First Lutheran in downtown San Diego, a pretty white congregation. We have uh, a few people of color, uh, mostly black Americans. Um, but in one instance, I can think of um, this woman was a church leader. She was on the council. She was a member for many years. And eventually um, she left to join uh, an Episcopal church that had a largely black membership because it just felt comfortable. And we were talking about, you know, if we want to have diversity, are we talking about at the congregational level where people really do like to be with people whose language and culture are similar? Or are we talking about something at a different level? At, at, are, are we talking about, and, and maybe engaging with each other congregation to congregation? as opposed to trying to represent a bunch of cultures or, or races in one congregation. And I just, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the complication because <laughs> um, yeah. it is all of that. Um, and you, I mean, I understand what you're saying about, you know, it's sharing a language or sharing food, but what is your neighborhood makeup? You know, we're, you know, the neighborhood around First Lutheran in those condos, is it reflective? Yeah, well, First Lutheran is one you, of those congregations. When you go to that, the grocery store. First Lutheran is one of those congregations. It's not a neighborhood congregation to start with. Yeah. But there's, there are residences around yeah. within blocks of you. Yeah. You know, and who's shopping and who are you shopping next to in the grocery store? You know, mm -hmm. and how do you, and it's, it's going to take time and patience for that to change. I understand exactly why that individual left the left first. That makes perfect sense to me. It, and I understand it too. It broke my heart, but I really understood it. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have an exact answer for what that has to, what that needs to look like. 
Well, yes. I guess the, then the question is, where do we put our energy when we talk about mm -hmm. diversity? Mm -hmm. um, it, it would seem to me that we might might get more traction starting to look for congregations um, that are different from us to do ministry with. That might be a start. Um, and as I mentioned, even within our leadership synod and our synod office leadership, who are we calling to our uh, pastoral staff? You know, those are big ones. But yeah. those are those are changes that you know when it's when it's reflected in that way, I think that that does change things for us. Yeah, I, we can I, look I, at. I mentioned this in my small group. We can look at Southwest. Our Southwest Synod, right? You know, and we're doing a lot of work with them lately. Well, how did they? How are they so much more diverse than we are in leadership? What have they been doing that we haven't? Tyra, please. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to. I was just going to say we meant we talked a little bit about what you're doing, Tyra, in your group. Would you be willing to share with all of us what's going on from your perspective? Oh, yes, but yes. <laughs> but before that, um, I was going to share a book. So there's this book that I read in college because my professor is cool. And um, it's called uh, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Yeah. The title is really important, but it also is misleading but what it what it teaches you is why birds of a feather flock together and you'll always have that one bird that wants to like go somewhere else but they always end up going back to their original nest because there's something that the nest gives that the other place does not even consider so if you're ever wondering um how like if you're experiencing a congregational moment where you're starting to see it diversify, but as those people come in, they also like don't stay quickly and they leave. I would strongly recommend reading the book. So again, it's called, um, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Um, and I guess the subtitle is in other conversations about race, but it's by Beverly Daniel Tatum. I'm gonna give you an Amazon link in the chat. Thank you. But, um, <laughs> Going back to uh, Joanne's comment, so um, <clears throat> I'm just now getting comfortable talking about this out loud, so I just need a moment to process, but um, And please, Tyra, if you'd rather not, feel free to say so. No, 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 it's okay. I just want to make sure I articulate because there are two things happening at once, which is why it's able to work the way it works. Um, I work with youth. I'm also a worship leader. And obviously, I'm a Black woman. Um, so or maybe that's not obvious. I am a Black woman. I identify as Black, although my background is Haitian and French, which is a whole other thing. But for the sake of this conversation, I am identifying as African-American and Black. Um, so I was the first Black woman to ever lead the house band at the youth gathering in 20 some odd years of it ever being a thing. And I was the youngest house band leader as well. Um, and my kids saw that and was like, oh, this is a thing, like our people can lead. Um, and then they, they got spoiled. And when I say our kids, mm -hmm. I mean the kids in my congregation specifically, which are black and brown kids. So they got spoiled and they went into other spaces and were like, where are the black leaders? We have, we know black leaders. Why aren't they on the stage? Where are the brown leaders? So at Senate Assembly, um, when they were voting for Bishop, our, our youth like interrupted Senate Assembly. They organized themselves. These are high school kids. They organized themselves. They interrupt Senate Assembly. They march up there and they started making demands um, to the bishops. Like how can you possibly even like not, how can you run for Bishop and not consider youth and not consider youth of color. And it was like a whole thing. Um, and then other adult leaders took them aside afterwards. It, it was all done and was like, if you wanna do this, we support you, we'll go for it. So it caught fire. And um, 
And they created a safe space just for youth of color within the New City Parish Community Churches of the Southwest California Synod. Then they asked if they could expand this space with other youth. Um, and so we have, we have now, and they were very specific. They wanted to see all youth across all three synods become united for change in our church because it affects all of us because we're all primarily in California, Hawaii, Guam, Nevada, yes, but primarily in California. Um, so I got some friends together. I know they think I'm crazy, it's fine. And we got some kids together and they, we taught the kids some things and they started to lead. Um, and they will be, they will start having deeper conversations in January. And the first topic that they will talk about is race and how it affects them as youth. They also are living through the pandemic. They also are experiencing George Floyd and so forth and so on, right? So um, oftentimes what they told us was the adults talk at them and not with them, forgetting that they're experiencing the same thing. And they want a space where they can have these conversations and they can learn skills so that when they are the adults, they can lead change. When they do get the right to vote, they can vote correctly and make change. When they are asked to stand up in front of however many people and speak, they can say the right things to promote change. Um, but I have to be very, very honest. It's so scary and it's so hard because you don't know. There, there are two things happening at once. You don't know what's gonna happen in the world that's gonna affect them, that they're gonna walk in with. Like today we're fine, tomorrow, God forbid, but tomorrow there could be like a mass shooting and that's going to affect them. And so we have to navigate those waters. But also the other part of it too is each of them have their own little background stories. Each of them have their own personalities. Each of them have different gifts and you want to elevate all the gifts at once. So it's been um, on the planning side, it's been more challenging, I think for us but the kids are like, oh yeah, we got this. Just sit over there. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so I'm going to listen to you. If you got it, you got it. Um, I was sharing in my group though, one of my challenges right now is making sure I am doing everything I can to connect with our Native American youth and our Asian Pacific Islander youth. Um, because that it, those are the two groups that we don't have as many participants of. So um, finding the adult leaders that can speak to that those two communities that can bring these youth in. And then our job is to keep them engaged and to make them feel like this is their space too, because it is their church too. And to also turn them into leaders. Going back to Pastor Manuel's point this morning, if we don't have them, we have to create them, right? If we don't see them, we have to create them. So we're trying to start this streamline of creating little leaders little Lutheran leaders in the church. So. I know that was long, but yeah, that's the Thank story. you very much for sharing that. Sorry to put you on the spot. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Tyra. That was really powerful for us to hear. Thank you. Inspiring too. Thank you both. Anybody else have any final thoughts or would like to share? Tyra, I reached out to you directly in the in the chat. I would love more information about what you're doing. I have um, I have three teams that I lead at our little church in Ascension. So awesome! I would love. Thank you. I would love for you to share that because they are um, they are hungry to meet up with other teams, particularly uh, and expand their their peer group in the church to have some diversity. Would I think be really helpful for them? Yes, um, I don't know how to do this, but I can send it to whoever wants the information. I just don't want to send it a million times. So can I streamline it? Do I send it to to the coaches? I don't know who I send it to, to get it out to everyone so I don't miss anyone. Oh, you can send it. Yeah, you can send it to me and, and we can put it on um, our coach web, our page um, and we can share that. Absolutely. Um, okay. That'd be awesome. Or if you just send me your information, Tyra, I can email you too, so we can connect. That would be great. All right, so we have had an amazing conversation. Thank you for um, 
sharing Pastor Manuel, Tyra, for all of you coaches who've come, and for all of you leaders who've participated. We're grateful for your time. As we wrap up, I just want to let you know that we have made a recording of this session, so it will be up on our webpage. So please feel free to um, share that once it's up. We have a survey that we could do, but we're over a little bit of time. So I just want to honor our time today. We, we gather every first Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. to have these conversations. And if anybody would like to hang out and share a little bit or to gather more information, you're more than welcome to share. And as we wrap up, I would uh, like to close us in a word of prayer. So let us pray. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden. Through perils unknown, give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.